And good evening, everybody. I would uh, request everyone other than the speakers to mute their mics, please. It's 8 o'clock and uh, we are uh, ready to start our this week's episode of uh, Marvelous Medicine. So today's talk will be given by Dr. Krishna Kumar. He's the clinical professor and head of pediatric cardiology at Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Kochi, where he established a pediatric heart program. He did his MBBS from Maulana Azad Medical College, Delhi, and MD Internal Medicine and DM Cardiology from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Delhi. He also received the gold medal in cardiology. He did his fellowship in pediatric uh, cardiology at Boston Children's, and he is also a fellow of the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association. On behalf of Amrita Institute, he received the BMJ India Healthcare Award for Quality Improvement. And uh, that is why he's going to speak to us uh, about improving outcomes in surgical patients. He has published extensively and is also the editor of several reputed books in pediatric cardiology and intensive care. Moderating the session will be Dr. Suchitra Ranjit. She's a senior consultant and head of pediatric ICU at Apollo Children's Hospital, Chennai. She did an MBBS from Pune University and BCH in MD Pediatrics from Calicut. Subsequently, she um, went on to do pediatric intensive care and is now the Asian representative of the World Federation of Pediatric and Intensive Care Societies. She's on the International Task Force of a Pediatric Surviving Sepsis Campaign and her areas of interest are improving outcomes of septic shock and severe dengue. She and Dr. Krishnakumar have worked together and we hope to have a very fruitful discussion today. Over to you, Dr. Krishnakumar. That's it. I just get to start this uh, session. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. I'll share my screen. Um, and again, uh, I think uh, quite honestly, I, uh, I, I've liked what I've heard. You know, you introduced uh, me to marvelous medicine and I think two episodes I've listened to. Uh, ever since you've, uh, you've contacted me to talk about uh, an area of interest, I started listening to the episodes. And uh, I, I just have to say this is fantastic because this is a great opportunity for cross-disciplinary learning. And even in the area, in the era of uh, webinar overload, I find this uh, quite refreshing actually. And I loved the last episode on communication. It was fantastic. So uh, to, to me, it's a real privilege because I, I actually love to relate to people across other disciplines because I think I find it most enriching. And uh, and I think this uh, would be a great opportunity to, to improve or widen our horizons. And I also have to thank uh, Suchitra for joining me because I have tremendous respect for her acumen skills and her judgment. And uh, she's been uh, um, advising and mentoring us on, on ICU issues for quite some time. Uh, so I, I have to say that it's very unusual for a pediatric cardiologist to get involved in surgical outcomes, but I have a reason, very specific reason why I have done that. But I'm just going to throw up a few questions uh, just to put uh, some level of um, interest in the context. Uh, and I, and I got into this from a book, which I, uh, I really found very nice, uh, which I think every citizen of the world should read, particularly the ones who live in high income nations. So this is a question that, I mean, you can think of the answer, but uh, I, I'm sure most of you will get the answer, but what would surprise you is the scale. Uh, and, and, and if you look at this question, where do the, where do the most most of the people in the world actually live in middle income countries, but the percentage that lives in middle income countries is huge. Three quarters of the world's population lives in middle income countries. And, and there is a reason why I'm coming to you with these questions. And this book is from, this is a highly recommended book, which is uh, very easy to read, very light reading, but very interesting and very insightful. Uh, I will then come up, you know, you can see that obviously when, when, when the world's population is mostly in middle-income countries. We call it LMIC or low and middle-income countries. The fact that the children, the pediatric population is, is massively in these regions. It's even more uh, so than 75%. And 
the reason why I'm coming up with this, and this is obviously because of a different demographic uh, uh, pattern that you see in, in, in low and middle income countries. So next question I'm going to ask you is, what is the rank order of congenital heart disease as a cause of infant mortality in, in let's say, middle income countries? And Tamil Nadu and Kerala and Maharashtra would all fit into the de description of a middle income or middle socio demographic region. So I wanted to take a shot at this. Just think about it. Obviously, we don't. I didn't really design a poll, uh, but I want you to think about it. Top four between four to eight, between eight to twelve. And as it turns out, um, and the answer really would surprise you, I guess. So as it's happened, you know, the, the world has been changing so fast and we haven't realized it. And some of us are still holding on to our concept, preconceived ideas that we might have uh, created when we were young and, you know, the kind of information that we got 20 years ago, but lots have changed since then. And the proportion, the infant mortality from all causes have declined quite rapidly, but the children born with heart disease have stayed the same. So as a result, um, in this study that I was a part of, I was a part of this global burden of um, uh, congenital heart of, of disease study, and we were the collaborators that worked from all over the world. And we put together this, which was published in Lancet in 2020. We were surprised that congenital heart disease in middle SDI, Middle Social Demographic Index countries, is now number two as a cause of mortality between one month and one year of life. And it is it was pretty significant even in 1990, but it's risen to a very high number. And that was particularly true when we realized uh, and we started the Hridiyam scheme in Kerala, where it was a very important cause. And the final question is, what has brought about the transformation in outlook of neonates and infants with congenital heart disease? So this is something that, that is very dear to me, and it's really something that uh, uh, attracted me to pediatric cardiology was the fact that in early 90s, I saw the prospect of a dramatic change in the outcomes that we could achieve on babies who were universally dying. So that was the era I was in All India Institute. I just finished my DM. Dr. Ayer had just started to attempt neonatal heart surgery in India. Seriously, in the sense, uh, in a systematic and a sustained way. And what I noticed was he was able to actually do a very good job under very challenging circumstances. And I saw that this could be transformation. And this could completely change the paradigm on, 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 on a whole set of diseases. And uh, we were, of course, well behind the West. And I tried to look into reasons why we are not able to replicate a complex medical ecosystem the way it existed in the West. And it got me very involved deeply into the surgical program. That wasn't necessarily encouraged by the others in my department, but uh, it was something that fascinated me. Uh, another a little secret I'll tell you once I... Uh, get to another uh, uh, is, is the fact that I always wanted to be a surgeon and um, fate got me into medicine and, uh, and it's a very interesting story. In any case, there is this tremendous disparity in access to surgery. And if you look at uh, high income and low income countries, it's only 7% of the world's uh, population that have access to heart surgery, world's children. But when you take heart uh, heart surgery, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's much harder when you talk about infant heart surgery. When you talk about newborn heart surgery, the requirements are incredibly stringent. So the number of children that have access to neonatal heart surgery in the world is minuscule. And it's only largely limited to high income nations. So this is a graph, you know, on, that shows you the number of cardiovascular centers for a given population. You can see where Africa is and where United States is. And this disparity is, is quite significant today. And it's one of the most bothersome aspects of our of health inequity that we see globally. It's not talked about enough, but it is a serious 
problem that will eventually become very significant because babies are infant mortality is declining everywhere in the world so about my story i uh, did not get into surgery by accident i, I don't know so would uh, hoodi or ravi shankar and i were classmates at school and i was basically essentially a fairly significant underachiever but then eventually made it into medicine in in maulana azad and then uh, went to pgi uh, entrance exam and uh, i did rather well so i was first in the surgical list and i thought i'm pretty certain about getting into surgery but what happened then was that the they took one look at me and they said you're too young to join i just out of mbbs you come after 6 months i said but how can you throw me out they said no you you just come after 6 months and so in that why why i got i was given very low marks so i i was out of the uh, contention and i just got so <laughs> disillusioned that um, in the next exam that i appeared in all india institute i put medicine as my second choice and i got medicine again i didn't get cert so i somehow ended up doing medicine and then doing cardiology and then eventually uh, i for some reason i was i did my dm in all india institute but i saw this man who transformed my thinking dr trandan was such a inspirational figure that i really wanted to be like him and he was a pediatric cardiologist who couldn't do much in those times really because there was very little that was available in terms of uh, therapy for children with heart disease but he trained at boston children's and he sent me back he said you need to go to boston children's to train because that's the place and and these institutions of course transformed my thinking but what i saw at all india institute and what i saw at boston children was very important what i saw at all india institute was tremendous individual talent and over a period of time actually dr uh, iyer was doing a terrific job but it was still very difficult for him he was a one man show and the surgeons would would operate and sleep that night in the icu and do it day in and day out and just unsustainable there were no systems to support their efforts and the whole notion of teamwork was just alien i just saw that there is so many ways we can actually improve outcomes for these babies and i just didn't understand where we were unable to implement them. there was some significant cultural issues with working together when it came to indian medical systems particularly at, at those times uh, it was very hierarchical uh, and it was tremendously the nurses were disempowered there was a poor understanding of infection control so many things that i saw were dramatically different at boston children's so i told myself i got to come back and find a way to replicate these outcomes i just told myself i don't know i couldn't do it for some time came back to india but uh, for a couple of years i was kind of lost i was uh, not able to get uh, uh, a, a get into a hospital of my choice i was in a corporate hospital and we were turning away kids because they couldn't pay but then i was lucky that uh, at one day i just got called to amrita institute of medical sciences this was october 1997 i just about heard about very vaguely heard about amrita institute but something told me that their mission was very grounded and very much in connect with social realities they wanted to make a difference to the region i met the director who's still the director now dr prem nair then of course um, every single hair is now white and ron ron is an american who was the ceo of the hospital and they were inspirational i had no uh, religious inclinations i still met amma and i i, I did find that she uh, at least in one way immediately appealed to me was the fact that she wanted to address the problems of the poor in the region and said that we shouldn't be sending these children from kerala to tamil nadu to chennai for surgeries we need to establish something here that's i was given a clear mandate and i used that to develop the center so i think i'm going to ask these questions today what determines the outcomes after infant and neonatal heart surgery i think you will a lot of you will resonate with this because i think most of today's medicine uh, in some way or the other is is much more complex than it used to be there are so many aspects of the, so many disciplines that require a very significant multidisciplinary input whether you take hematology oncology transplant medicine pediatric intensive care general pediatric surgery there is a lot of uh, need to 
into uh, to to interact with a variety of disciplines to enable good outcomes and that's something that is very important that we need to understand and i think the new paradigm of pediatric heart care is the new paradigm of healthcare across the country across modern medicine and and, and we need to recognize that there are so many elements and i'll talk about the amrita experience and its lessons so let's look at the first question and i i know this is very pediatric cardiac specific but i'm sure that you will find parallels within your respective disciplines so in very simple terms pre surgical outcomes in children is determined by their pre operative situation the quality of surgery and the quality of post operative care the pre operative condition can be cardiac or extra cardiac cardiac really is how accurately you assess your anatomy and how complex the anatomy is and how accurate is your physiologic assessment and how much of a and what exactly is the physiology extra cardiac so so sure the uh, demographic factors birth weight access to follow up care uh, syndromes uh, other system defects so many issues infections and we've had to really deal with a multitude of comorbidities that that uh, uh, come along with heart disease and, and, and they really impact outcomes with a by far the most important factor is this, the quality of surgical care without question i mean however good everything else is if you don't have good surgery that that whole the whole thing will fall flat on its face and so that's very very important you need a good surgeon who can do a quick job and a perfect job so with a short bypass time a short cross clamp time and does not leave residual lesions amazingly actually the quality of surgery globally in many institutions has dramatically improved um and and this is something i've seen that the learning curves of surgeons have shortened considerably with pediatric cardiac surgery and this is really impressive to see without question quality of intensive care is an, another incredibly important variable which which really uh, makes a big difference uh, to outcomes especially when you have complex children and it's it's monitoring it's the hemodynamic support its rhythm management its management and identification of residual lesions its systems really how good the systems how robust they are how sustainable they are with with policies with quality of nursing infection control respiratory care etc etc so really this is how it all comes together with 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 uh, cardiac surgery in children and i think it it's sort of similar to any thing complex that we do in medicine we we'll are doing increasingly complex stuff so this is something that i found which is very interesting success is a few simple disciplines and it so much applies to what we've done uh, it's the small details it's the boring mundane stuff that you do day in and day out and that's essentially what determines success whereas failure is just a few errors in judgment that you keep doing it your day in and day out and 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 this is incredibly true for our discipline as well so this is story which i found tremendous um, um, i could relate to it tremendously so this is uh, sir david brailsford who is a legendary british cycling coach so you know in 2000 1908 to 2003 the entire british cycling contingent had won one olympic medal and it was considered a huge embarrassment because in most other disciplines britain had done pretty well they invested a lot in cycling but they just got very poor yield in fact so much so that companies would not want to endorse their products with the cyclists because that would go against selling the product so they hired brainsford and what he did in 5 years was that 60% of the olympic medals were won by british cyclists so a dramatic transformation happened nine olympic records seven world records five tour de france winners in a relatively short time he accomplished something tremendous and what was his mantra so he talked about improving everything by 1% now i've just got some things listed out here there were a number of other things as well but every single element had to improve and cumulatively they aggregated and there was this substantial shift in the overall quality that translated into the results that you saw 
and it's pretty much the same story about what we do yeah, with, with, with pediatric heart surgery as well. And this is also a Japanese principle, which is uh, essentially relates to the same thing, uh, the Kaizen principle, where we, we keep looking at small, small levels of improvement on a daily basis. It's, it's, a, it's a culture that you have to imbibe. And so the elements, the simple elements of pediatric heart surgery or pediatric heart care is cardiology, cardiac surgery, and intensive care. But each of these elements have other sub-elements, and each of those elements uh, have people and have uh, systems that need to be addressed. So in I made this collage. Uh, so I, I, I was obsessed with the whole concept of teamwork in our hospital, and I kept telling them that we need to foster this team spirit. It seemed very cliched to some extent. People got sick and tired of listening to what I was saying all the time. But believe me, uh, we just had to keep doing it. We just had to keep doing it. And not just within our own discipline, but talk about other related specialities. And I, in fact, worked pretty hard to get other specialists, pediatric specialists within our hospital so that you know we could have better care for our patients. I managed to get Dr. Sheila Nambudri to be hired for genetics. And then, you know, we've had over a period of time, a number of pediatric subspecialties that have came, come in uh, and it's really grown into a tremendous situation. Of course, so every other area that, you know, that you realize that there are so many players that need to be, you know, uh, recognized and acknowledged. So today's paradigm really is that we exist in a complex ecosystem. And this needs to be understood. Many of us, we lose sight of this fact we end up with insular lives and we don't really realize that we are part of a very complex ecosystem. And we're just a cog in a very large machinery. Today's surgeons and cardiologists. And cardiologists are no different from surgeons. You know, we interventional cardiologists also have something to do and gives them a sense of, you know, sense of accomplishment, sense of doership, and a sense definitely it, it serves to boost their ego. But we just can't afford to be insular. Uh, and, and that success really today is dictated by how well coordinated we are. Without doubt, we can't exist as superheroes, individual superheroes anymore. And we really are in, we extremely dependent on, on the system. The whole notion of quality improvement does not have to be pursued as a science or as a discipline with its own jargon. It's the philosophy that you embrace, the, the idea of continual improvement that needs to be embraced, otherwise it will be imposed. It's, it's just a matter of time. We are having so many regulations coming into our medical field, and it's only a matter of time that quality improvement will be imposed. You will have to share your data, and you'll have to do those things that are essentially minimal requirements. So the key considerations really with quality improvement is systems thinking. You need to not exist in silos a participatory approach and shared accountability, evidence-based. It's very important that whatever you do in terms of quality improvement has, has been tested. The systems thinking really is that we cannot afford to be insular, as I was saying. We need to recognize that there are many, many aspects. Uh, you need to just think about any situation that you see in the ICU, any problem that you see, you need to look at the whole system that is responsible for that. And you need to fix it from that approach. Everybody needs to adopt that way. Very important to, to make every member of the team feel that they're contributing to the cause. And every member of the team feels proud of the outcome. So there's got to be this whole participatory approach, which is seriously lacking in Indian medicine. Uh, it, it's even, uh, we've not come even remotely close to engaging uh, our workforce in the way we should be doing. And there is tremendous talent available. And there's tremendous commitment and there is tremendous potential for quality. So our nurses are largely silent still. And, and that's a huge problem. Other thing is that it's not a question of just evidence, but we need to have contextual evidence. The evidence that we have created with our own work, which is you know, relevant to our systems, uh, whether, it, whether it's post-operative infections where we, we, we documented using the World Surgical Database or uh, determinants of our, our outcomes in our own setting uh, and and how do we implement infection control in our own setting. So these are all papers that we have written, that I have written along with other co-workers, which generated contextual evidence that enabled our QI processes. 
our story was that we started in 1998 and i wrote this mission statement i remember sitting with mr ron and writing it and it seemed uh, quite utopian at that time that we needed to be accessible to every every single family in the region yet we need to deliver cost effective care but our outcomes have to match that of boston i set my standards there and we need to train and teach at all levels build capacity and do research that is relevant to our context that's not contractual but contextual and of course these were my colleagues who enabled me dr suresh rao who was the surgeon with whom i joined dr uh, uh, shiva prakash was also joining soon thereafter they left subsequently and they are leading other programs in bombay but they left behind a tremendous legacy arti hejmadi was my first student so to speak she is now a associate professor at uh, seattle children's hospital but she and i essentially this was the team that put put the program together in the beginning of course i showed you this collage we grew quite rapidly and managed to put this program and then we started looking at our data and i have to say these were not flattering so we looked at our neonatal surgical outcomes and we did manage a reasonably low mortality with neonatal heart surgery even in the early years but our infection rates were abysmal almost embarrassing our sepsis rates if you look at it was you know about a quarter of our babies were getting septic newborns and that's completely unacceptable mortality was not too bad by by those days standards but the sepsis rates were terrible ye bandi jo da padha sab band lag gaya no no again talu ke raha na bada then uh, the other thing is of course we were plateauing after 2002 our outcomes did not improve we had still a lot of preventable icu events that used to happen so i asked these two questions how do we improve outcomes one is that what is not under our direct control was under nutrition consequences of late presentation associated infections the condition of our babies resources they were not under our control and i asked the question how much do they matter and what was our control was quality of the surgical repair in the sense we could discuss with our surgeons about some aspects of give them feedback quality of perfusion creation of a cohesive team effort in changing the culture uh, eliminating the hierarchy robust qi systems and infection control and the question we had to ask was what difference would this make so this essentially was the two sets of questions i kept asking um, along with of course my colleagues and we did a lot of key interventions so the key intervention the first key intervention was administrative engagement and you you can't get by without it. so you need to sell this whole concept to and i was very lucky i had administrators who were completely willing to listen in fact so much so that one of the administrators i could have as a phd student in infection control and he was my phd i i, I was his phd guide and we wrote the, the whole notion of low cost infection control came from that and that enabled them to set up a very good infection control system change of culture so we had to disrupt some hierarchies we had to empower our nurses this was new in the region and it's and it's incredibly valuable to empower your nurses it has a direct impact on outcomes we had to be honest about our shortcomings and seek expert help of course we had to get some dedicated space for our icu get dedicated designated leadership in our icu and we joined most importantly we joined an international quality improvement collaborative that harness the power of data and that allowed us to benchmark our results with the global uh, situation and of course we have tried thereafter to try and uh, develop a more sustainable system for our nurses so this is our icu today and much of what has been done here uh, i owe to dr rakhi who who i just she's an anesthesiologist so she doesn't have background in pediatric intensive care formally but i this is the best we had at that point but she and she went to stanford for like 3 months trained with my former mentor who is now the chief at stanford and in 3 months she was just an observer she hadn't passed mle but she came back with all the systems and laid down the entire framework for our icu in terms of just systems and of course that had an immediate impact we could measure that impact then 
the whole uh, idea of doing rounds uh, together that's something that we've done every single day where the cardiologist the anesthesiologist the intensive care the surgeon and uh, the nursing as well as other ancillary services social work etc come together and round on each patient on a, on every single day and then we established infection control systems uh, that I spoke to you about, which is very, very important that involved, that didn't exist at that time. And we had to create it for the hospital. Uh, it was done primarily with the goal of having something robust and sustainable in our own program. And this is uh, how it evolved into Sanjeev Singh was our infection control champion. And, and we have a number of very, very extraordinarily accomplished multidisciplinary team, including a microbiologist, Dr. Anil, and, and a whole lot of people who came together. And this has been a pillar, really, of uh, support in terms of keeping infections under control, but also addressing issues like antimicrobial resistance, ensuring some level of antibiotic stewardship, etc. Et and it's been a very robust. And the stars really are our infection control nurses who've been who've been tremendous in terms of how they have grown and developed without formal training, amazingly. And I think this really helped, which is joining an international collaborative on congenital heart disease. And this is one of the, this is amazing. This is one of the world's largest surgical databases. It involves 75, 75 sites in 30 countries and includes a database of 45,000 pediatric heart surgeries. So we joined the collaborative and shared our database with that and shared our outcomes. And we keep getting our six monthly reports, which is benchmarked. And our QI programs, which are held, webinars, um, so, so many things that are implemented because we are part of this collaborative, which involves a surgical safety checklist that is uh, tailored to pediatric cardiac care, nurse empowerment. Every little aspect that I have been discussing is formalized and taught through this collaborative. And of course, the impact has been extraordinary and measurable. And we partnered with NGOs, and one NGO is Children's Heartling. That actually, so so once you start and venturing into something, and you people notice that you're delivering good outcomes, they come and fund you. So Children's Heartling funded a number of other aspects of care that I have listed out, and we got them to fund almost every single intervention that that we have uh, that I have talked about. Um, and and it's been tremendous. And we, we have this 20-year partnership that has been. So, so over the last several years, since 1999, we've, we've just had these interventions that have, you know, taken us, uh, you know, one step at a time towards eventually in the 2014, when we got the BMJ award, we were not actually delivering fantastic outcomes at that point. At that point, our surgical mortality was still uh, three, three and a half percent. We hadn't touched our nadir. Uh, which happened, I think, four years later, three years later. But, but I think they they saw the the uh, the way it was implemented and they liked it. Uh, but it's all about teamwork. It's all about collaborations. It's all about willingness to learn. It's all about openness that 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 made the difference. And uh, it's much because I essentially because I had a tremendously enabling environment that allowed me to really express myself through these um, ways. And it really made a difference. So these are, of course, the papers that we published during the course of this whole process. And we used a, a lot uh, of help from nurses, from experienced nurses who really taught us. So this is uh, uh, Jeannie Pfeiffer, who is an infection control, who's actually an infection control legend. She came uh, uh, during the Mumbai floods and got stuck. but. Nonetheless, that was after she had, you know, spent nearly two weeks with us and, and, and really injected and started our infection control. And this is Sandra Stavetsky, who set up our nurse residency program, again, did her PhD thesis at uh, our hospital and looked at a, a number of QI initiatives that, that have transformed pediatric cardiac care. So the outcome trends have been uh, heartening to see because of all that has been done and we've been able to track them. So what we do is that we have audited data uh, from the IQIC that we, we have for ourselves and we can benchmark it with the average of the IQIC sites. So this is our in-hospital mortality trends, which on 2010 was, I told you, 
about four, four and a half percent of surgical mortality came down to about one percent in 2017-2018. And this is despite increasing complexity, increasing proportion of newborns, et cetera, et cetera. A 30 day mortality is also showing similar trends. So this one is actually benchmarked because this is the standardized mortality ratio. So the line is where the collaborative is, the, the blue lines are where we are. So we actually did better than the collaborative, but we got even better with time. Uh, and, and this was tremendously heartening to see. Uh, similarly, infection rates. We had a very embarrassingly high incidence of surgical site infection, which rapidly came down. I think the surgical checklist and a number of simple initiatives changed it all. And that then surgical site infections have disappeared now virtually. Bacterial sepsis also showed this very nice downward trend. And any major infection was, was, we were much worse than the collaborative, but eventually we got better. So this took time, of course, and this is a big threat. And I have to say that we, we have to acknowledge, at this point, I have to leave you on a sobering note, because there are some very serious threats to our sustainability. All that we have done may not have, may not stay because we, are, we have to deal with some very important threats. And I think the big threats are antibiotic resistance. Um, we've, still, we've lost at least one baby or two babies in the last year from multidrug resistant infections. Simply, nothing else, just multidrug resistant pneumonia. And that's very worrying because that can then uh, you know, wipe out your unit and the benefits can all become much less and there is still this tremendous um, level of overuse of antibiotics. We've been disciplined in our unit. We've tried our best, but it's so hard uh, when you have a number of team players, when you have a number of caregivers. Nursing is a big, big, big problem in India today. With the uh, after the pandemic, there is a tremendous exodus, and it's so so difficult to cope with that that we may not be able to sustain the quality of care that we've been having in the. That's simply because of the disparity in salaries. And just as you know, in the 70s, the physicians of India migrated to the, to the West in large numbers because of the salary differences. That's exactly what's happening with the nurse. Surgeons, there aren't enough surgeons being trained. Our program is not actually economically viable. We are dependent so much on external funding. The costs of care are very huge. There's very poor compensation from public insurance. The schemes the government announced, it's terrible in terms of the, to compensate for the quality of care that we have to provide. So these are very serious threats and we have to acknowledge them and address them as we move forward. So parting thoughts really for delivering good outcomes in low resource environments really, or anywhere for that matter, you need a cohesive multidisciplinary team. I think the nurse, empowered nurse is the very core of this team. We need quality consciousness at every level, not just at the, at the leadership, but at every, even the most humble sweeper, the person who cleans the ICU should do it with, with passion, dedication, and a sense of pride. Only then you can actually translate into good outcomes. And then you've got to collaborate. You have to think about it determine the nature of the collaboration and absolutely without collaboration, without working together, this is not going to happen. So really in our part of the world, it's, I've got these mantras that I've written for low cost care. It applies to any specialty. You need to connect with the family, with the average family in the region and understand their, their economic challenges. You need to multitask as professionals. You need to focus on low cost uh, QI systems. You don't have to buy the most fancy MRI machines or set up the hybrid ORs or the, buy the most equipment. It's the simple systems that make all the difference. The most difference comes from that. And then, of course, you need to tailor your solutions to based on your economic realities. We can't just embrace new technology without proof of benefit. And we have to improvise. We have to do our jugad as, as all of us do. Uh, and, and, and that's the fun part, of course. And with that, we can get there. We can, we can compete with the best in the world. And of course, I, I think it's very important that all of us embrace a very inclusive definition of progress. And progress in medicine should not be just doing some fancy procedures or you know, doing uh, something which nobody else is doing 
or doing the transplants, doing the high-end technology work, but it's actually being available to every child in the region or every patient in the region. This is my team. Actually, I just represent uh, a group of exceptionally talented, professional, committed, and dedicated individuals, uh, which at the very center is my surgeon, Dr. Brijesh, and the other, his colleagues, Praveen and Balaji, and of course, everybody else. I just happen to represent them and speak for them. Uh, and I've been longer in the program than anybody else. So I get to do that. But yes, it's, it's, it's the team that has made all the difference. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Krishnamar. Over to you, Dr. Sujitra. Yeah. So. Yep. Uh, so first, thanks, Vidya, for inviting me to moderate this fascinating session. And uh, really, uh, you've uh, just taken off. So many people are interested in this. Um, you have a lot of off the beaten track kind of topics. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really useful and um, it's a really nice mix. And um, uh, I'm honored to moderate the session where KK is speaking. Really, uh, KK, is, uh, he's a, he gets embarrassed when I tell him, but I truly admire the work that he does. My husband's a pediatric cardiologist as well, so I know very well that uh, KK is a very well-trained and very accomplished pediatric cardiologist, but all of that is eclipsed by his work that he does in, in team building and quality improvement. And, and I think many of us try and do in our own way, in our own units, in our own hospitals. But what struck me is that the work he does is quality improvement, helping children from lower resources get excellent uh, outcomes like we heard. But this is not just in his own unit. He has uh, attended several conferences that he's organized where, you know, I mean, he's, he's got talented people from overseas. They come and really uh, discuss one case in great detail, right from pre-op, intra-op, post-op. So it's all minds put together trying to improve and, the, and, the, and each message uh, it's quite simple, very easy to implement, and he kind of curates them and clarifies and delivers. So I feel that he's, as one person, he, he's had an impact on so many units, on so many people, so many children, so many, um, you know, I mean, at every level is just a nurses that are always smiling and so empowered, never scared to ask if some, when I visit to the units, I could see that they're not scared to, or overwhelmed by a surgeon who's coming in and they were very uh, smilingly offer the hand hygiene bottle to them to use. So at every level, I think he's made an impact and that's kind of, you know, grown so much. So, I mean, it's embarrassing, I know, but he is doing it and um, he's continuing to doing it and doing it. So I'm, I'm really impressed and great work, KK. <laughs> Uh, congratulations seems a small word to offer for all that you do. Uh, uh, what I uh, what I would like to say is that uh, I just love that one percent uh, story because uh, I know we all know that much maths, but still we never look at it. So irrespective of what speciality we are or what work we are doing, if we promise ourselves that we'll do one person better tomorrow than what we did today. Uh, it looks like that itself will make a huge uh, impact, equivalent to getting an Olympic uh, medal. So thank yeah. you for very, very, uh, you know, reproducible tip, which all of us can just go back and do from tomorrow morning. So thank you for that. Uh, 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 Radha Krishna, you have any questions for KK? No, it's an overwhelming lecture, I should say. No questions, though. Like, I echo what you said just now, that we, you know, we rarely find uh, someone who will try to bring people together and, you know, get extract from each of them and it should add up. That story of uh, that cyclist is, again, I think is a great example. I think I should stick a cycle picture in my outpatient and to see, look at it, that, uh, see, 
every one person together will make such a wonderful it is possible in everything we do every damn thing every step we do i think it's possible to do that and it's it's really really wonderful we can we all i been mean, in especially the corporate sector been primed to do things for ourselves our own you know an individual glory but then we never ever think of having uh, many people contributing especially the nursing and all that i think is a wonderful story and again i think here uh, i very fondly remember dr suchitra who treated my 11 month old son for 5 days i <laughs> think many many years ago that is a very handsome 18 year old <laughs> i made the worst days of my life i should say two wonderful people today thank you okay Okay. So, uh, so this session wouldn't have been possible uh, unless uh, Ravi Shankar, A.K. Budi, got me in touch with uh, K.K. So, Budi, would you like to say something to K.K. now? Sure, absolutely. I, um, you know, when I suggested this, uh, Vidya, I did not know the full impact um, or, or the full extent of his impact, and I'm, I'm. totally speechless it hardly ever happens all of you who know me know that you know speechless is not something that uh, comes naturally <laughs> to me but i am and um i'm i'm still collecting my thoughts but the most the foremost thought that comes to mind is in order to achieve this level of improvement um you have to start out with not being defensive about anything at all you know if there are mistakes accept them or if there are things that can be improved don't be embarrassed by it don't be um, um you know don't try to assign any sort of blame or anything i that's the part that i really loved with this um uh, presentation was it was all about what is the problem how can we solve it um and 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 i think that is another very very uh, um important message to take home from the uh, um presentation today which is basically that you know it's very human when you're confronted with something that has gone wrong to to assign blame or try to even think about who's to, who's responsible in so saying we're all collectively responsible we need this is an error this needs to be fixed and how do we do that and you know and then you come to this mentality of okay all of us are going to um you know pledge a 1% improvement and then collectively uh we can uh, you know end up uh, thing it's like that nayador thing right sati hath badao milkar whatever that you know all of all of us old timers will remember that song but anyway that's that's the thing every individual contributes enormously every uh, um uh you know uh, I, i know that kk uh, took a lot of time explaining the the role of uh, nurses i i think the role of nurses in any icu is really underutilized in many countries um uh, because they are the people who are in constant contact with the patients and empowering them and uh, educating them and holding them you know both accountable and responsible will definitely um improve outcomes and it's probably one of the lowest hanging fruits that people can uh, reach for um uh, and, and i'm going to stop here because i really don't have any experience working in icus or uh, as a surgeon or even uh, you know in these high risk um uh, uh you know pediatric cardiology situations but i can tell you that when we see as pediatric endocrinologists when we see neonates um with ambiguous genitalia which is our the worst nightmare uh for anybody um uh, primarily the family but eventually um you know everybody who's taking care of these babies so it becomes very important to have um you know this kind of uh um team where everyone is working towards improving outcomes where everyone is working towards and outcomes don't just stop with you know the child is alive and the child has been discharged it continues into how does this child grow up what happens to these children eventually um and you know did we make the right choice um and and you know if you look at it, it it's it's these efforts at quality improvement that have now led to really what i would think are very important concepts on you know masculinization or feminization is not just in the external genitalia but also in the brain and um you cannot take a fully masculinized male baby at birth and castrate that baby and expect that baby to grow up as a 
completely well-adjusted girl. So it, these are all things that come only from these continuous um, uh, efforts at continuous quality improvement to see how we are impacting everything. And I think, um, I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm sure we will see more data from his group um, uh, because not only do they do this work, um, they also have been very diligent about documenting it, sharing the information and publishing it, which I think is enormously important so that people don't make the same mistakes that others have made, even, even if it's a negative thing. So, so with that, I'm gonna stop. Thank you. Thank KK, wonderful, absolutely fantastic. So we, we have uh, Dr. Suresh Bapu with us. If something can be equated to pediatric cardiac surgery, it is advanced uh, uh, neurosurgery, which probably has a similar kind of, uh, you know, high pressure setting with uh, very low margin for error. Uh, Dr. Suresh Bapu, would you like to say something on uh, quality improvement? So you're muted, sir. Could you unmute yourself? Uh, thanks for uh, calling me. See, I've been trying to bring down the infection in many ways in our unit. In spite of that, I know it's very hard and I fully agree that the uh, nurses are the very important uh, task force who are there with the patient all the time. We visit the patient for a few minutes and then we give instructions, we go away. But uh, we learn a lot from the nurses and uh, they, I think if you want to improve our quality, we depend a lot on, on them. They're, uh, as you said, empowering them, educating them, and learning from them. So I, say, I tell that the nurses are professionals. So they are professionals like we are doctors, they're professionals, and nurses are uh, professionals in their own way. And so uh, we have learned a lot from them. So uh, it's something I really admire the way Dr. Krishna Kumar has achieved uh, this uh, excellence uh, in uh, uh, his unit. I think I think all of us should strive to do that. That will I'll stop with that. Thank you, okay. madam. Thank. You. Uh, Nalla, you would like to say something? Uh, Nalla runs a very high volume bariatric <laughs> surgery unit where they do extremely uh, high risk patients. Uh, Yes, severe uh, obesity as well as uh, comorbidity. So, Nala, uh, what would you like to add? Uh, thanks, Vidya. And that was a lovely talk uh, from Dr. KK. Um, the good point is that we are our, most of our surgeries are keyhole and laparoscopy. So, obviously, the spillage and contaminations are much lesser. So, uh, it's a different uh, spectrum of the game. But coming back to what uh, I wanted to say, I started my training with uh, KM Cherry and doing my fellowship in cardiac anesthesia. And those days, uh, Dr. Suresh Rao and uh, Satya Prakash, uh, Haridas, all of us were colleagues together. Uh, I, what, one very important message that I wanted to say is that as a cardiologist, you have done so much. It's very, very rare to have a cardiologist to be interested and get on with so much of workload. And the 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 com the, uh, the the way you put in the cycle, that was fantastic, because you put in the cycle. Most of the surgeons put in the spit pot of a Ferrari race. <laughs> That's how a neonatal surgery is concerned. <laughs> the surgeons told them that it's the spit pot pit spot of the Ferrari race where all the four wheels, all the nuts and bolts are changed, and that's the teamwork. Uh, end of the day, it's all a teamwork. And I totally agree. A uh, teamwork and a good leader. Leadership is very important. And I'm so proud of you, KK, that you've taken so much of lead. If you do not have a good leader, then it's, it's impossible to impart all this into your juniors. And we should always look upon our paramedical staff, not just the nurses. I consider myself the whole paramedical team because we have a lot of healthcare assistants and you know, even the boy who cleans the floor, as, you, as someone said, uh, they are all the, they, they, they are very important. And one key element which I would like to share to all of you is, I have retained my team for 15 years now. It's almost 13 years. I'm completing my 15th anniversary in Medcare. 
but my team has been there with me at least for more than 10 years so it's the same team and we have only been upgrading every year as you rightly said you need to go through all the uh, upgradations and your credentialings but end of the day it's it's a team work and i am very happy that a cardiologist as you has done such a lovely work thank you vidya um we have with us uh, dr sai janani we both work uh, in same organization although not in the same uh, city uh, we uh, we are quite uh, lucky that the uh, administration uh, actively encourages uh, quality improvement and uh, they have uh, they are you know um, of course for some people like kk mentioned it's, it has to be forced on them but uh and before that it used to be you know the speed breakers used to be put on anyone who was trying to do any quality improvement so for that there is a big change that those who are interested in quality improvement are able to implement so sai would you like to say something uh ma'am it's a really good thing to uh, empower our nurses as we have seen actually i have uh, been trying to start something on acute pain services and post op analgesia management and all and also on peri operative uh, you know co- stabilizing and optimizing comorbidities and all and the biggest support is the ward nurses literally uh, they are the ones who give good feedback and they are the ones who implement what we say and if i tell her you call me at any time of the day they call and they report that the block is working today ma'am this block is not working what should we do and everything and uh, they just need to be taught in um, kind of their own language and uh, then they literally uh, you know do really well and the patient outcome is really good in fact in leaps and bounds because of um, you know empowering the paramedical staff this is one thing that really improves our outcome of our patients uh, so uh, back to you uh, suchitra would you like to add something on the topic or your experience of improving quality in your eyes <laughs> uh nothing really to add but um, as as kiki said i guess it's it's all team work but it's just a question i have for kk um i mean it just something i've noticed for the last uh, maybe the last few years that as cardiologists do more and more interventions more of the you know routine stuff and uh, are uh, done by the cardiologists the surgeons are left with really complex um, uh, anatomies to repair and it's protracted post stop sometimes multiple surgeries and uh, often sometimes when i see these children when they come for follow up they are still huffing and puffing and just borderline um, you know uh, functional so i'm just wondering uh, if at some point because when you have a busy cardiac service the numbers are important and sometimes there's a bit of a blur at how much we should and can be doing what yeah. what would you say it's a very good point uh, so we've changed that uh, consciously in our unit we refrain we, we take every patient and offer the best possible out, uh, option for the patient so if there's a child with for example i'll give you an example i simply do not close small vasds uh, at all uh, which is now becoming a major uh, intervention across the world, across many centers or if i have a certain concern like you know neonatal coax people balloon dilate but i know that it's not going to give a good outcome so i offer those to the surgeon so every patient we discuss together what would be the best option uh, for the patient and we come to a consensus we don't do anything that uh, the other doesn't agree about so that that uh, commitment had to be made on day 1 uh, we've never violated that and we've never done something that uh, the surgeons can deliver a better outcome with so that needs to happen in the unit and once that happens then really there isn't much of a problem the surgical complexity does go up as the simpler cases are done elsewhere that's happened with our program also but it has been manageable uh, so i think uh, it's just a question of understanding uh, each the, it's the the key understanding the key players in this whole team are surgeon and the cardiologist and at the top if there is a dysfunctional relationship the, the team will not will not survive it's very important to 
make an investment it's like marriage you kind of have to invest in that relationship it's sort of that way uh, uh, would a registry help sorry uh, sorry but would a registry help all of all india registry where um, because for some disciplines um complex procedures etc they you have to you know put it in justify what is done also include the follow up data yeah uh, i'm doing kind of one stuff. right so now all india Hmm? Yes, I'm doing an all India registry uh, right now, Suchitra, uh, where I could only include okay. five centers from various regions, and we are tracking, uh, including every single infant heart surgery, and tracking their neurodevelopmental outcomes, and correlating okay. that with uh, with the complexity of the surgery and the preoperative condition. So we've so far enrolled 500 babies, and okay. uh, it's 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 very doable, so easy to do because we've got a web-based registry and it's a tablet-based data entry, and we've got right. neurodevelopmental assessors. So once you set up the systems, it's a really very easy thing to do, and can be done for so many areas. And I'm sure it, there are aspects of intensive care that that really can be be studied through this process. Of course, yeah. Okay, that's it. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Th thank you, uh, KK, for uh, offering to do this talk. And uh, you know, despite not n knowing me from Eve or Adam or whatever, uh, you readily accepted. And uh, thank you for even following up with our other uh, topic sessions. And uh, and uh, next week uh, we'll be doing uh, uh, Doctor. We'll be having Doctor Jose for talking on surviving sepsis uh, uh, guidelines, spe uh, with special emphasis on the ones that came out recently. We'll have Suchitra also once again on it. And uh, thank you everyone for joining. And uh, if uh, I, I would like to repeat that if all of us take home that message that all we need to do is uh, one person improvement day on day, uh, we can uh, reach a uh, very, very uh, unimaginable uh, level of uh, quality. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we'll meet again next Thursday with another episode of Marvelous Medicine. Until then, take care and stay safe. Good night. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank Good you. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night.